Good day. I'm Tom Munger from Mayo Electrophysiology. With me, my colleague, Dr. Peter Noseworthy, also an electrophysiologist here at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Today, we're going to be visiting about the role of ablation in atrial fibrillation. And atrial fibrillation, as all of you know, is a very common arrhythmia we deal with uh, each day. It will affect over a quarter of the population that's reached the age of 45 and over and has been increasing in frequency uh, dramatically over the last several decades. So today's discussion, uh, we were going to uh, talk about ablation, and there actually are several uh, trials that are uh, actually relevant for this. And Peter, I was going to start by asking you about the Cabana trial, which was a large randomized trial uh, completed here by Doug Packer. Yeah, great. Well, it's nice to be with you today, Tom, and there's a ton to talk about. It's very exciting times in EP. I think we have uh, more trials over the past couple of years than we've had uh, probably for the decade before, and there's been a lot to talk about and a lot to think about. Probably the most awaited trial in uh, cardiac electrophysiology was indeed the Cabana trial, and that was a study that was powered to look for hard cardiovascular endpoints. For a long time, we've been looking at surrogate endpoints like atrial fibrillation control and atrial fibrillation burden, and this magic of 30 seconds of AFib being the endpoint. But this was the first to really look at that hard clinical endpoint. Uh, many of us thought we may be able to demonstrate an improvement in stroke, mortality, major bleeding, cardiac arrest with ablation. But as has been well discussed with this trial, there were a lot of crossover. There were even some patients in the ablation arm that didn't undergo ablation. And the effect that was seen in the trial was not robust to those sorts of uh, trial execution issues. And it was a negative trial or a neutral trial. So it left most of us think, thinking about the role for uh, catheter ablation still along the same lines in terms of symptom control and uh, reduction in atrial fibrillation burden. Now, within Cabana, there was a suggestion in the subgroup analysis that it might be a benefit for heart failure patients in particular related to the intention to treat analysis. Um, can you comment upon sub-studies of Cabana in relationship to heart failure? Yeah, well, I think Cabana will be the gift that keeps giving, and we're going to see a lot of sub-studies uh, from these very valuable data. And actually, just last week, or it may have even been earlier this week, we did finally see the results of the uh, heart failure subgroup. And indeed, there were uh, nearly 800 patients in the trial who had heart failure. And in that subgroup, there was a benefit in terms of the primary endpoint of the trial. Now, we always have to take these post hoc analyses and subgroup analyses with a grain of salt, but it's at least uh, something that I think is emerging and is consistent with the overall literature that perhaps we have to be more aggressive for management of atrial fibrillation in patients with concomitant AFib and heart failure. Now, there was the Castle uh, HF trial also before that, right? And so uh, compare and contrast that with Cabana. Well, that was, another, that was another very dramatic trial in our field, and we actually was one of the first to demonstrate a mortality benefit uh, with catheter ablation. Those patients were very different than the heart failure subgroup of Cabana, we think. In Castle AF, they all had cardiac devices, and it was a study of systolic heart failure. We don't have echo data on the entirety of uh, patients from uh, Cabana, but it looks like most of those patients had heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So together, these two studies support ablation, I think, in heart failure population, regardless of whether it's preserved systolic function or whether there's reduced systolic function. Now, going back 20 years, there was the AFFIRM trial, and that was a large randomized trial conducted early on in my career where over 4,000 patients were randomized to receive either rate control or rhythm control, and that was a neutral study. It really didn't show a benefit uh, for mortality um, or stroke uh, at uh, early maintenance of sinus rhythm versus just a rate control strategy. And so I think that's driven a lot of the thinking over the last 20 years that we'll treat these patients, we'll try to rate control them, and then if there's problems, we'll move to a rhythm strategy. Uh, talk about that and, and any studies that would address uh, early intervention uh, that are new now. Right. Well, in some ways, there's been this competing narrative over the past uh, several decades. One camp saying, really, it's all about stroke prevention and rate control, and rhythm control has a minimal uh, role only for symptom control. And then this concept that AFib begets AFib, and that we need to interrupt that vicious cycle. And 
I, I think that most of us sort of come down on one of those two camps. And a recent study, the EAST trial, readdressed that. Much like the uh, AFFIRM trial, it was an examination of rhythm versus rate control, but this is very early in the course of disease, and in fact, many patients were enrolled after their first episode. This, although we're talking about ablation trials today, this was not an ablation trial per se, and less than 10% of patients in EAST actually underwent ablation, and many were treated with flecainide and some with amiodarone. But it did demonstrate an improvement in hard cardiovascular endpoints with early rhythm control, I think causing many of us to reassess that notion uh, that has been established after a firm. I think it is generally supportive of early rhythm control. Mm -hmm. Patients in that uh, trial EAST um, had an average age of around 70, so I think it would be typical of a lot of patients that we treat. One caveat would be, of course, that those patients, uh, many of them didn't have symptoms uh, that were very remarkable. And then the other would be uh, many, actually up to half, had it as their first episode of atrial fibrillation. So um, comments about that, is there uh, any questions or concerns that arise from that? Is it representative of patients that uh, those of us watching uh, today uh, would be expecting in their practice? I think it's I think it's representative of the patients that uh, the viewers are probably seeing every day in their practice. Sometimes in electrophysiology, we see people who are sort of at the end of the road and they've been uh, managed for years and years, and those would not be the typical EAST patient. Um, your question about the relationship between symptom burden and then hard clinical endpoints is an interesting one. And there have been studies that demonstrate that people who present either without symptoms or with atypical symptoms are actually the population with a higher rate of cardiovascular endpoints. And that makes sense if you think about an older patient with more comorbidities that may be competing for their attention. Sometimes atrial fibrillation is caught incidentally in that group. And that's a group that we worry about incident cryptogenic stroke and uh, you know, Medicare uh, studies have demonstrated that the mortality in that group is even higher than the stroke risk. So perhaps recognizing AFib in that population, treating it early, even if they're minimally symptomatic, may help move the needle in terms of hard clinical endpoints. Yeah, I'd agree with you. I have a sense that um, putting patients just on a RAID drug and sending them out into the wild blue yonder sometimes is not productive because for the reasons you say, they have atypical or minimal or no symptoms and then they show up back in your clinic two years later with heart failure. So I think one part of this that we have to keep in mind is that uh, regular follow-up of these patients has to be done because they can uh, get out of uh, hand, so to speak, with uh, with other things like heart failure if, you, if you're not watching them. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I think smart people can disagree on the role for early intervention and rate versus rhythm control, and we can all look at the same data from different approaches, but I think your point of following patients closely and intervening when it becomes justified. There are certainly many patients I still treat with a uh, rate control strategy, but we'll see how that evolves over the coming years. How about early ablation? Uh, what can we say about that at this point in time? Uh, you said there was only 10% that were actually in an ablation uh, uh, bucket actually in the EAST trial. So uh, anything else that would address that question about early ablation? Well, we have two uh, new trials just this year, uh, early AFib and STOP AF, both of which looked at early uh, cryoablation for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. These were smaller studies, so they're not powered for the same sort of hard cardiovascular endpoints that we saw in Cabana and EAST. But uh, they either monitored for atrial fibrillation with a loop recorder or with a fairly rigorous protocol of serial ECGs, Holter monitoring, uh, and so forth, and demonstrated in both studies a consistent result that catheter ablation was superior to antiarrhythmic drugs for the maintenance of sinus rhythm at one year. I guess one other thing we don't know yet uh, also with uh, trials like EAST is the persistence of beneficial effects with uh, early rhythm maintenance. And I'm reminded about Gene Poole's recent uh, paper on the late scud heft results. That's a defibrillator trial looking at primer prevention in heart failure patients. And actually, early on, both ischemic and non-ischemics were shown to uh, have benefit, whereas in the later analysis, now out 12, 15 years, the uh, beneficial effect of the defibrillator really only stuck in the ischemic group as opposed to the non-ischemic group. So I think we have to keep in mind that longer-term follow-up will be beneficial in the AFib group of patients as well, I think. Um, 
Talk about lifestyle modification. That's a big deal as far as uh, ablation outcomes or even just uh, AFib in general. Right. Well, you and I both do ablation, and uh, it's easy for us to focus on that as our as our lane. But we have to think of atrial fibrillation, I think, as a common final result of many uh, comorbidities that are all interrelated. And unless we can address those in a holistic and comprehensive way, we really are not doing our patients much benefit. So I think uh, just like there's a nice literature around the intervention for lifestyles around the time of a myocardial infarction, I think we can t think about an AF ablation or presenting for atrial fibrillation care as a sentinel event for a patient to reassess lifestyle interventions and go down that laundry list of things that, that are addressable and modifiable. And it will pay dividends not only for the atrial fibrillation, but for uh, their life in general in terms of hypertension, diabetes, obesity, sleep apnea, energy level, and all of this. And uh, patients will do much better if we take a comprehensive approach. Peter, I think those are all terrific points that you've made about lifestyle intervention being akin to post-MI care or the patients who have uh, coronary disease, and they're all applicable to atrial fibrillation as well. Today, I'd like to thank Dr. Noseworthy for these very important insights that he's given us about ablation and atrial fibrillation. And I want to thank you all for joining us on theheart.org, Medscape Cardiology.